man's name is Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. Another one of the gentlemen, forgive me, I forget his first name, but he had the same last name as myself, Douglas. And then there was another name, another gentleman by the name of Richardson. All three of these gentlemen were running for the Republican ticket. And I must let you know that since I'm talking about the Republican ticket, there was no Republican Party prior to this election. This was the first, this was the inception of the Republican Party in the year of 1860. Quite naturally, hearing of Douglas, I wanted him to be president. And the reason I wanted Douglas to be president, as you might suspect, because his name was equal to mine, Douglas. Well, once I found out what his platform was about, then I moved from him quickly. Because his platform was not, he was not interested in bringing slavery to an end. I listened to what Mr. Richardson had to bring to the table. He was more or less um, a repeat of Mr. Douglas. But then there was this man by the name of Abraham Lincoln. And one of his campaign slogans was to somewhat, and he would not come out, you know, blankly to say that I'm ending slavery, but if you listen closely, you knew that one of his missions was to end slavery, even though his wife, Mary Lincoln, anybody ever heard of her? Mm -hmm. Okay. She owned slaves. So there were slaves there at the house. And one thing I found out about Abraham Lincoln as myself, he was poor. I also found out that he wasn't that intelligent. I also found out that he had a hard life. So there were some parallels there. Well, I liked Mr. Lincoln so much that I, ca I started campaigning for Mr. Lincoln. I campaigned, I campaigned hard. I convinced a lot of the blacks to vote for Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln wound up winning the campaign by a small margin. Well, I think it was 1862, October, ma'am, I made my way to the White House. I went to the White House, and when I got to the White House, believe it or not, I was the first black man to enter into the White House. Speaking on that, as I went to the front door of the White House, I knocked on the door. The guard came, and the guard said, you must go to the back of the door. You must go to the back if you want to enter in. Well, I didn't know that in order to get in the White House, you had to go to uh, another location to sign your name. So what I did, I signed my name, and I stood outside like everybody else. All of a sudden, I heard, Frederick Douglass. So I made my way in. And as I made my way in, I went, I made it to the Oval Office. Ma'am, when I walked in the Oval Office, there was a big, gigantic desk. And there was this large figure sitting behind the desk. This figure that was behind the desk was six feet, four inches tall and skinny as a rail. <laughs> there you go. And he invited me in. He says, please, come in. So I come in, and I step to him, and as I step to him and I look, wow, he's a tall man. Well, I went to introduce myself, and he says, no need. I heard all about you, Frederick Douglass, and I've heard what you said about me, how you've been cutting me down, the negative things you've been saying about me. Have a seat, Mr. Douglass. Well, usually what I do when I have students in the audience I would take my seat, instead of sitting like this, at first I would begin off and I'd say, now Mr. I sat in the chair, but I didn't sit like this. I didn't sit like this. I didn't sit like this. I didn't grab myself. You know what I mean? So I sat down respectfully, like I had some sense. So everybody did what you do. They would do what you do. They'd start giggling and laughing. The kids, they'd be like, you know, have you ever noticed when the kids start squirming, laughing, giggling? You know they're wrong. They tell, that's how they tell them themselves, you know. You know, they start shaking, you know. So anyway, I'm sitting there, 
I'm not calling the lady. And Mr. Lincoln says, well, Mr. Douglas, how can I do for you today? I said, sir, I come on three behalf, sir. I come because of the fact that, first and foremost, I am very interested in finding out where will my people be free? What are you going to do about that? Number two, I come. And at this time, the civil, we were on the hill of the Civil War beginning. And my wonder, if you will, was when are black men, when will they be able to go to the front line and fight? Now please understand, ladies and gentlemen, black men were serving in the, so in the military. But they were serving in such a capacity such as dishwashers, such as butlers, such as, you get the drift? Mm -hmm. But my interest was, when will the black man be able to pick up a rifle and go to the front line? The whole essence of it was is that, why are you fighting this, this war with one hand and another hand behind your back? The hand behind your back are the black soldiers. And we were losing many of our, our soldiers. We were losing. So that was a concern. And last but not least, I take my hat off to all you beautiful ladies in here. Because of the fact that I wanted to find out, through the President of these United States, when were women going to be able to vote? Not just black women, but women of all kinds in these Americas. Well, after I got through with my little spiel, Mr. Mr. Lincoln, he got up and he went to the window and he moved the curtain, he looked out, took a pause and a deep breath. He comes back to me and he says, well, Mr. Douglas, you bring some mighty good points to the table. However, I think we should wait. And I'm like, wait, sir? He says, well, you don't want to upset the status quo. Because if we move too fast, then we'll find out that they will have a lot of death on our hands. So we should take this kind of slow. And it's funny, as I get to this point, ma'am, I was read, doing some reading such as I do now, ma'am, I was reading as Donald Dowrish, not as Frederick Douglass. <laughs> and in this whole instance, it was pointed out that when President Lincoln looked out the window, he was looking down the road, maybe a hundred years from now. Well, a hundred years from that point would have put us at 1963. It would have put us at Washington, D.C., August, August the 28th. It would have put us at a 5'6 in height statue man with a microphone on his, in front of him, in a podium, with, a, with Abraham Lincoln as statue behind him. And with this man speaking, I have a dream. So here we are, 2019, which is how many years away from 1963? I'm not really that. 55, 56. 56. 56 years? Right. Wow, I was born in 56. So that's 56 years that blacks in this country would have been freed. Would have been freed only 56 years if we would have waited, such as President Abraham Lincoln says, down the road. Well, after our meeting, Mr. Lincoln, he shook my hand. I shook his hand. A very firm handshake. For a tall, slim man of his statue, he had a very firm handshake. Well, as I left the building, I got outside the White House. And as I got outside the fence, I stood there. And I looked at the White House. And I said, wow, I can't believe it. I was in the White House. Well, I made my way back to Rochester, New York, to my family and what have you. On December, I mean, January the 1st, 1863, we were all awaiting the word. Well, out of nowhere, sir, here comes Paul Revere. Paul Revere comes, I'm just making that up. Because <laughs> Paul Revere, he said, what did he say? He said, the one is coming, the one is coming. Yeah, the British is coming. Well, let's just put a... a a likeness of Paul Revere. Rode up, and as he rode up, he got off his horse, and he unraveled his documentation, and he read, on this day of January the 1st, 1863, the year of my Lord, it is stated by the President of these 
United States, President Abraham Lincoln has signed in effect, starting on this date, the Emancipation Proclamation, claiming that all blacks in this country are forever free. I have you know there was great jubilation all over the air. I even cried. Yes, I cried and we hugged and we threw our hats up in the air. And ma'am, it was a very frosty night, but we didn't care because we were jubilant. And we parted, if you will, until the coming of the sun that stated that we were free. Well, as I move on, I took on different posts. As a matter of fact, I became the first black man to be president of a bank, the Freedom National Savings Bank. I also uh, became uh, ambassador to the United States in Haiti. I held that post for two years. I also became the first black marshal of Washington, D.C. And ma'am, let me see who I didn't speak to yet. Let me see who I didn't. Sir? No. No, no, this is Women's Rights Month. Ma'am? No offense. He's like, he like, I can't believe you did that to me. But ma'am, as marshal of Washington, D.C., I went back and I paid a visit to my slave owner. Master Hugh R. At this time, he was old, he was frail, and he was on his deathbed. Well, when I walked in to talk to my master, as he laid there, he called me Marshal, because I was a Marshal. But I said, no, call me what you used to call me. Call me Freddie. And he called me Freddie, and we started talking. And we had some heart-to-heart -heart talk, sir. I asked him some hard questions. I said, which I didn't explain to you all, I said, why did you do what you did to my grandmother? So what they did to my grandmother, sir, they moved her out to a cabin by herself as she became frail. And when she passed away, they just dug a hole and they just put a, put a body in a hole. No funeral, no casket. He said, Freddie, I do apologize. But in the end, it wasn't my decision. I also must state to you, Freddie, that I really was against slavery. But I had to go with what was going on at that time. And Freddie, I must tell you, you was a good kid. We all loved you, Freddie, as a kid. So allow me at this time to apologize for whatever we've done to you. And I'm so happy that you have grown up to be who you are and to make the impact in society such as you did. And we shook, it, we shook hands, but his hand was so weak. I shook his hand, and I put his hand down. And as I departed, maybe about two weeks later, the news that came to me that he had passed away. Well, 40 years later, from that time that I met Anna Mary, when she became Anna Douglas, she passed away as well. And I have you know that it really shook me to my core because she was my everything. Though she could not read, though she, she could not write, but she married my five children. She took care of my five children. secretary by the name of Helen Pitts. Helen was a hard worker. I loved opera. I invited Helen to go out to opera with me and she agreed. Helen was 20 years my junior. I was 66. She was 46. Helen also was white. Helen and I, we wed. My children was very upset. Helen's family disowned her. So we escaped. And we went on a six-month trip around the world. 
And even though she was 20 years my junior, I must state, I really enjoyed her. If I had to say, if anyone was to question me about which marriage was the best marriage, I would definitely say that Helen was my number two best marriage. <laughs> <laughs> the day was February the 20th, 1895. I'm at the age of 77. I'm invited out to speak. I get in the carriage and it takes me to the Washington Convention Center. This time, we had moved from, Washington, from Rochester, New York to Washington, D.C. Anaconda. Um, uh, I was going to say Anaconda. Mm -hmm. I was just watching that movie, but um, forget me. Mm -hmm. The city slips my mind. But it's outside of Washington, D.C. I take the carriage to the Washington Convention Center. I make my way up to the podium, and to my amazement, I'm sitting next to my close friend who I had met in Rochester, New York. And some of you all might have, and might still have, and as a matter of fact, when I was cleaning it out, I ran across one of the coins. Anybody have an idea who I'm talking about? Susan B. Anthony. Susan oh. B. Anthony. Yes. Susan B. Anthony and I were very close friends. As a matter of fact, there was talk that her and I had a relationship back in the days when we were younger. So she helped me from the stage after I did my speech. I got back in the carriage and I made it back home. As I walked in the door, Helen was entertaining guests in the, in the kitchen and I slighted to her that I'm going upstairs to rest for a minute. She said, she asked me that I want some tea. And I said, no, I maybe, I, maybe when I when I'm rested because I had another engagement. Well, as I made it up to the first step, I jerked. And Helen hollered and she says, Frederick, stop playing. Now, sir, I was a big jokester at the house. As a matter of fact, one time we had guests that came in, came over, and my grandchild, because I had so much hair, they had braided up my hair. And when I went to answer the door, we were trying, they were trying to unravel my hair. When I went to answer the door, I still had braids in my hair. And the guest was like, Frederick, what's going on? You know, and I had to tell them that my playing with my grandchildren, they braided up my hair somewhere. So Helen said, Frederick, stop playing. And I said, no, I'm not playing. So I took another step. And as I took another step upward, I had a major heart attack. And that's where I died at, on February 20th, 1895, at the age of 77. What's so amazing about that is the fact that upon my funeral, I laid in state in the Capitol building. I was the first black man to lay in state in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Not only that, ladies and gentlemen, there were kings and queens that came from abroad to visit me. My body is currently laying next to my wife. Which wife? First. The first one. In the funeral, in the, in the funeral home, in the cemetery in Rochester, New York. I take my hat off to Helen because of the fact that because of her, my home is still, um, well, my home was purchased by the Parks and Recs Forest, forest uh, Service. Uh -huh. So they upkept my home, and that's why it's still a national monument to this day. I visited the home in 2012, and I was so amazed that when I stood there, I could actually look down, and I could see the White House, I could see the Washington Monument, and the Capitol Building. So Frederick had an idea that I would purchase his house but I will let white folks know that I am just as good as they are. And believe it or not, Frederick did not die a poor man. He died a rich man. And not to shine negativity on Frederick, I will say that his daughter, Rosetta, she married. But the young man he married, I mean she married, turned out to be a pain in Frederick's book. Nick. <laughs> because he wound up, believe it or not, he wound up suing 
Frederick. And he won the case. He was, ma'am, for a lesser kind of word, he was classified as a bum. <laughs> <laughs> so, that kind of gave Frederick, you see all the gray hair? That kind of helped Frederick get some of that gray hair down. But, as I end, the last words that could be classified and notated is that in an interview, one of his last interviews on his way home, the young man asked Frederick, how can I be, do more in society? And Frederick turned to the young man and he said, agitate, agitate, agitate. Those were his last known words. And with that, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your patience and waiting for me. And I hope I've let out a lot of information that is useful to you. Um, questions? Answers? I mean, questions? Thank you. Thank you. So while you're trying to think of some questions, I'll just hand this out to you, if you don't mind. This is my latest book that has yet to come out. It's called Motivational Moments. We just need one, three of us. Oh! Are y'all two together too? Oh! So he's driving. Okay, cool. Well, since he's driving, I'm, I'm still using the horse and buggy. You're welcome.
You know, it is what it is. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you think that Frederick Douglass was a bitter man? His, some of his speeches, of which I've read, have, are powerful. Yes. Do you think personally, though, that he was a bitter man or that he was just a wonderful um, orator and that he said what he said to get his point across? You know, that's a good question. And you know, I've never had that question posed to me before. I wouldn't say that he was an angry man. I think so much he had, and this is my opinion, I think he had a vendetta because of what happened to him as a slave. And his mission was, once he found out what an evolutionist, evolutionist was, his mission was to travel through this world and assure the freedom. Today, when we talk about sex tra trafficking, I think he would be very vocal on that, you know, because you're holding someone captive against their will. He was held captive against his will. So he was a staunch believer in freedom. Did he hate white people? No, he did not hate white people because he had great relations with white people. It's just the mere fact, it's just the, the fact that is that if he could recruit white people to speak for him and to come in and fight his battle with him, not for him, but with him, which he did because of the fact that he had that gift and he was a great orator and he knew how to talk and he more or less knew how to get what he wanted out of people. So I would sum that up by answering I don't think he was angry, but he had a vendetta. Mm -hmm. And the vendetta turned out to be a good vendetta because here we are, many years after his death, we're still talking about it. Mm -hmm. That's true. So he did a mighty work and he did a great work through his vendetta in this. Mm -hmm. I just made that word up. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. if you think of agitated, agitated, it's kind of like that's when things happen, is when people become agitated. Yes. When they're docile, you know. Like, okay, we'll worry about it tomorrow. Yeah, you'll put off till later. And, and later could be a hundred years. You know, and, and you'd have lost a whole life. Just imagine how many people that don't get to live to see a hundred years. But they've lived their life in such a docile mode, passive mode, that guess what? People begin to, to misuse them, abuse them. And, you know, and, I, and let's be frank, I got people in my family like that, and you might have people in your family like that. So, one thing, I, I, as I took on the role of Frederick Douglass, and I will be honest with you, I've, I've learned, I've matured a lot within myself, but I've had the opportunity to take a look out at people. And I must say that, you know, I, I, I'm not a sociology major, but I've taken sociology in school. And I will let you know, even though I dropped out, I do have a degree. So, um, in saying all that, there was a time, because of my upbringing, to be honest with you, I hated white people. Because of my upbringing and what I, what I witnessed as a child of the civil rights movement. And being called the N-word, being spit on, being having eggs thrown at, and seeing what was done to my uh, you know, immediate family. But as I grew older, I realized and I'm still learning, I'm still learning about you all, that guess what? You are people just like I'm people. I'm learning that you live and you die just like I do. I'm learning that they are poor white people just like they're poor black people. And I've learned, you know what I've learned? The world that we live in today is not about if you're white, it's not about if you're black, Hispanic, Iranian, or whatever. You know what it's about? If you got money. Oh my gosh. What? Yeah. And the color of money is not black, it's not white, it's not Iranian, it's not Mexican, it's what? Green. Yeah. And if you got a load of those things, them greenbacks, if you will, those Benjamins, I was in the store the other day. <laughs> and this old white guy, he walks in. And he says, uh, well, how many Benjamins would that cost me? And I looked at him and I said, excuse me, sir, what did you just say? He said, Benjamins. I said, why are you called Benjamin? He said, Benjamin. Benjamin Franklin is on. I said, oh. I thought it was just a black thing, you know. I'm 
getting my Benjamins. And I see this old white guy come and said, how many Benjamins will that cost me? I'm like, oh. So that's a defining line, if you will. Black, white, and all the other cultures that are here in America. If they got this, that's what brings us all together. So America, though we, we, we fly old glory, the red, white, and blue, but behind that old glory, red, white, and blue, there was a gigantic sign, and it's called dollar. So, ladies and gentlemen, I stand here black, looking at you white, we all in this together. And it's a shame, because I heard the other day, I was looking at the news, and they said, it's a shame that it will take another 911 for we as Americans to wake up and see it. If you notice, September 11th, how we all joined forces. We were together for maybe about two years, and all of a sudden, we went back to being who we are. I mean, you know, it's like family. You know, we fight within, but if outside come in, then it's wartime. Mm -hmm. So when they wait, when they took those planes and went into the World Trade Center, we looked out. We didn't look in. So we became one to fight the foreign substance. Once we fought the foreign substance. And we won, now we can go back to Harvard and fight each other. <laughs> not less, not less. You got a Benjamin to give me. <laughs> so with that, if there's no more questions, really sincerely from my heart, thank you all very much for coming out. I hope I gave you some good information to run with. And if you get a chance, tune in and hear me on, um, uh, on, the, radio. on the radio. And I know I shouldn't do this, because we are in this environment. <laughs> but uh, this is my last book, The Power of Being a Winner, which was number one on Barnes & Noble's uh -huh. um, motivational list. Uh -huh. Okay, so you can, uh, Amazon.com, uh -huh. all right? You can get this online, okay? okay. All right. Thank you very much.